you knew Volker very well. I did write a book on Volker. I wrote a biography of Paul Volker. You, I believe, served under Bernanke. Ben Bernanke did a great job. One more question. I, I have to ask you this. Sure. How was Alan Greenspan as a student? I understand you were his professor. <laughs> Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. Today, we have with us Professor William L. Silver, a professor of finance and economics at the Stern School of Business at the New York University. William holds a PhD degree in economics from Princeton University and has real world experience as a trader of gold futures on the commodities exchange and as a portfolio manager with the hedge fund Odyssey Partners. In addition, he has written eight books, the most recent being The Story of Silver, How the White Metal Shaped America and the Modern World, published in February by Princeton University Press. And we're delighted to have him here today as our guest. Good day, Professor Silver, and welcome to SBTV. How are you doing? Fine. Thank you, Patrick. It's a pleasure to be here. We're happy to have you. We're, we're honored to have you, in fact. Professor Silver, your latest book is about silver, and I can't help noticing that your last name in German is the word for silver. Is this a coincidence? I mean, I'm, I'm curious about the, the reaction of your family and your colleagues when they heard that your latest literary project is about silver. Well, my children uh, wanted to call it silver on silver but hey. the uh <laughs> the, the publishers thought that would be a little too personal but you brought up german in in the german it would be zilber on zilber and people would think it was my autobiography which it is not uh -huh. so we stayed away from that i also noticed in your bio from the university that you were a senior vice president for trading strategy at Lehman Brothers, a bank that was made famous back in 2008 due to the financial crisis. Uh, if I may, Professor Silver, what was your reaction when you received news that the 158-year-old bank had gone bankrupt? Well, it was uh, quite a surprise, um, especially since earlier in 2008, uh, the government had bailed out Bear Stearns which was another investment bank. Um, and Lehman was in the same category, it would seem. But evidently, uh, it was a shock, as big a shock to the world as it was to me. Uh, the world really almost came apart at the seams. So it was quite shocking for a, a firm that had existed since uh, the Civil War in the United States in the mid-1850s. Uh, to go bankrupt. I, I wasn't there at the time. I was. I worked for uh, for Lehman Brothers back in 1982 when it was still a partnership. So uh, it's it was quite a while since I had been there. Okay, and uh, I also read in the acknowledgement section of your book uh, that the passing of Nelson Bunker Hunt spawned the writing of your latest book. Can you share with us why it inspired you to write about silver? So uh, Nelson Bunker Hunt died in 2014. Um, and when I told my children that uh, Bunker Hunt died uh, and they had been working in finance all their lives, I said, Bunker Hunt died. And they said, say, isn't that the fellow from your Sunday golf game, who keeps on hitting the ball into the sand. Well, once they said that, I knew I had to write a story, tell the story of the richest man in the world, which is who Bunker Hunt was in the 1960s, how he went bankrupt buying too much silver. It turned out, it turned out that the story was much bigger than that, even bigger than, than Nelson Bunker Hunt, because the story of silver stretches back to at least 200 years since the beginning of the United States and had a big impact on American politics and world politics. OK, 
can you share with us the circumstances leading to the Hunt brothers noticing silver as an asset to accumulate? Sure. So uh, when I say Nelson Bunker Hunt was the richest man in the world, he comes for, he came from a very wealthy oil family, a Texas oil family, but he himself became the richest man in the world in the 1960s when oil was discovered in Libya, where he had the drilling rights. And he was a billionaire when the number of billionaires in the world could be counted on one hand. And then in 1973, Muammar Gaddafi, who had overthrown the king of Libya in 1969, nationalized the oil wells and Bunker Hunt suddenly had no oil. And he was very worried about inflation in the United States. Inflation in the United States, even in the early 1970s, had begun to run out of control. So he was looking for something to buy. And he looked at silver and he also looked at gold. He didn't like gold because the central banks in the world had so much of it that he was worried that they could dump the gold on the market and depress the price. So he chose silver, which was a precious metal, but did not have this huge overhang that threatened his holdings and the price of the precious metal. Okay, so uh, fair to say that inflation may have been uh, the Hunt brothers' motivation to accumulate some 200 million ounces of silver between 73 and 79. Uh, but was it their intention to manipulate the price of silver for personal gain? Well, look, uh, manipulation is easy to say and hard to do, like diet and exercise. So you can say you want to manipulate, but it's hard to do. And he was a very big investor, and he was accused of trying to corner the market and was actually prosecuted, or he lost a, he lost a case in civil court uh, about trying to, to, trying to corner the market. Whether he started, he certainly didn't start out that way. Whether his activities could be interpreted that way is still open to question in my mind. Okay. Was the rise of the silver price from eleven dollars to uh, in seventy nine to fifty dollars in January of nineteen eighty solely the result of the silver buying by the Hunt brothers, or did other events contribute to the skyrocketing silver price? Well, look, silver is uh, a protection uh, against um, any kind of crisis in the world, and there were a number of crises during 1979 that contributed to silver's increase. There was inflation. We had in the United States double-digit inflation. Double-digit was 13% in 1979 without any indication that the central bank could control it. And we've seen, for example, today in Venezuela, for example, out-of-control inflation debases the currency. So inflation was a big problem, but there was much more. There was uh, Iran and the hostage taking in of Americans in Iran in November. And then the Russians invaded Afghanistan in December. Both of those events created turmoil in world markets, drove up the price of gold, drove up the price of silver, and people accumulated silver to protect themselves in uncertain times, which is certainly what the hunts were doing. Okay, so I guess uh, there were a lot more things going on than just the, the Hunt brothers trying to push up the silver price. Geopolitically, as you mentioned, the, the Iran hostage situation, Russia going into Afghanistan, there was quite a bit more things going on that definitely had more weight than, than the Hunt brothers trying to push up a price. Well, there, all of these things contributed to lots of people buying both gold and silver. Now, silver went up 
much more than gold percentage wise. It went up twice as much as gold. But you know what? Silver is always more volatile than gold. It's been it's always more volatile. It's a smaller market. So it goes up a lot more in 2008. For example, when we had another major crisis, the Great Recession, silver between 2008 and 2011 quadrupled and gold just about doubled. So silver is more volatile. It was more volatile in 1979 and again in 2008. One more question with with the Hunt brothers. Uh, The U.S. Commodities Futures Trading Commission later charged the Hunt brothers with manipulating the prices of silver futures contracts and silver bullion. Do you think they went after the Hunt brothers because the government panicked a bit that the U.S. dollar was rapidly losing value against silver and gold? I don't think that was the motivation, really. I don't think that it was uh, the motivation of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission that had anything to do with the uh, with uh, the uh, foreign exchange value uh, of the dollar. I think the main motivation of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission was triggered by the exchanges themselves that trade, that sponsored trading in, uh, in silver, the COMEX, the Commodity Exchange, and the Chicago Board of Trade. Both of them were worried that the silver market was out of control, that they would have lost a source of business because people were concerned that silver had gone up so much that they couldn't buy it. So the, uh, the, the hunts were primarily um, forced into uh, avoiding bankruptcy in 1980 by the exchanges themselves. And only later, in 1985, did, uh, uh, did, the, uh, the, did the government go after the hunts. You said, and I quote, the outline of this book when I started five years ago differs considerably from the final product. Uh, history surprised me with events and personalities that changed my perceptions. Uh, Professor, may I ask how and why your original outline changed? What happened? Well, in the process of uh, doing my work, uh, I found uh, people who were involved in silver that uh, I would never anticipate. And one of the big surprises was Warren Buffett. Mm. Uh, Warren Buffett actually had been looking at silver before Nelson Bunker Hunt. Yeah. He started looking at silver in the 1960s when the United States was still making dimes and quarters out of pure silver. Yes. But silver and gold did not fit his investment strategy. Uh, Buffett liked to invest in companies that he understood, and uh, he did not like precious metals uh, that, especially gold, which he said, and I quote, would remain lifeless forever. But silver was different because silver not only was a precious metal, it also had industrial uses, uh, specifically in electronics and medicine. So Buffett kept on looking at it, kept on looking at it, and then he pounced. Pounced. How would you define pounced? Well, Uh, He waited almost 30 years and he was a patient, he's a patient investor. Uh, He waited 30 years until 1997. In 1997, silver had collapsed in value from a peak of $50 in 1980. It fell to $5 an ounce in 1997 and Buffett thought it was cheap, too cheap too cheap because it had industrial uses that exceeded production. So he said, I'm going to buy this metal and hold it as an investment, which he did. He bought 100 million ounces, almost as much as the hunts in a short period of time. 
1997, he bought it and he held on and he held on for eight years. And he sold it in 2005 when silver went to $7.50 an ounce. And he made about $250 million. Not bad, right? For anyone but Warren Buffett. $250 million on a $500 million uh, investment over eight years is not so good. It's about 5%. He sold it too soon. He became uncharacteristically impatient. Mm, I see. Um, but th I think th th this is the part that I, I think may puzzle a lot of people, including myself. Uh, we had the Hunt brothers, 200 million ounces of silver. We had Warren Buffett, 100 million ounces of silver. But were the two treated differently in some ways? Were, were the Hunt brothers, they, well, we know what happened with them, but Warren Buffett, nothing really happened to him, right? Well, it, 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 nothing really happened because he, in fact, disclosed what he was doing and didn't do it with anyone else. And one of the reasons the Hunts got into trouble was because they violated the monopoly, the Sherman antitrust laws by combining with other people. Buffett did it himself. And he said, I th just thought it was a good buy. And he did hold on for eight years. And we, we didn't get back to why he sold too soon. He sold in 2005. Had he waited another couple of years when the Great Recession started, silver spiked, yeah. as we know, from 750 an ounce to over $40 an ounce by 2011. And had Buffett held on, his $500 million investment would have been $4 billion return not a five, not a $250 million return. He would have made more than 15% on his investment. He became uncharacteristically impatient. He should have waited and used silver as insurance against yeah. a catastrophe like the potential from the Great Recession. Okay. I'm hearing the word uncharacteristically a couple times from you, Professor. Do you think, or I know the conspiracy guys out there, we're going to be thinking, was Buffett pressured to sell? You know, it's really unlikely that he was pressured to sell. In fact, he explained why he sold. He explained that he thought there was some speculative elements. He did not want to buy silver because of inflation. He bought it because he thought there was an imbalance in supply and demand. And then in 2005, he saw silver going up and he also saw copper going up. Mm. And he said, well, there are speculators. When the speculators are there, I'm not, I'm not going to be in there. And of course, what he said was, he's not very good at figuring out when a speculative boom was going to end. Of course, he didn't realize in 2005, it hadn't even begun yet. The speculative boom in silver, silver as a protection against catastrophe was about to begin. So I don't think he was pressured at all. It was his own, it was his own doing. He did it all, he did it all by himself. Uncharacteristically, he, he did that by himself. Uh, but I, I think another question that pops up is, had the Hunt brothers done it the way Warren Buffett did it, would the outcome for them have, have been the same? Uh, there was another big difference between the Hunts and Buffett. Warren Buffett paid cash. He did not borrow any money to buy silver. The hunts were very, very heavily leveraged. Leverage means they borrowed money to buy silver. And when you borrow money and the price goes down, you eventually have to come up with more collateral. And the hunts couldn't do it. And that's why Warren Buffett, when he says, he, he usually describes 
his holding period, when he bought Coca-Cola in 1988, 1988, they asked him, how long do you expect to hold it? And he said, my holding period is forever. Now, he didn't quite do that in silver. Had he done that, he would have been much better off and held it forever. But if you are not leveraged, you can afford to hold through the ups and downs. And the hunts weren't able to hold on. They were forced to sell. Whereas Warren Buffett, even had silver gone down, could have just sat there and waited. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I had also seen in, in the uh, acknowledgments over on Amazon the word obsessed. Were the Hunt brothers perhaps a, a little bit obsessed with silver? Well, precisely. That was another difference between the Hunts and Buffett. Buffett had only 2% of his portfolio of Berkshire Hathaway's portfolio invested in silver. And by the way, that's the right amount. It's around, I, I recommend, around 2 or 3% of your net worth. The Hunts, on the other hand, had really gone into silver lock, stock, and barrel. Mm. And it, it represented a huge fraction of their net worth, and they were quite wealthy. They had a lot of oil reserves. Nevertheless, they became obsessed with silver. And uh, Nelson Bunker Hunt could never understand why anyone would sell silver. Uh, so that was another big difference. Think of it as an investment. Think of it as portfolio insurance. Do not become obsessed. Okay, I will definitely uh, heed that warning. Um, but speaking of Nelson Bunker Hunt, he had a nephew by the name of Lamar Hunt who owned an AFL football team, Kansas City Chiefs, American football team. And he played a role in, in creating the merger between the AFL and the NFL. And he also coined the word Super Bowl from his children who had a Super Bowl. And I'm going to need your help here, Professor. The winner of the Super Bowl, the championship game, they get a trophy made from Tiffany and Company. How heavy is that trophy? So the trophy is in fact made out of sterling silver, yes. which is 92.5% pure silver, and it weighs seven pounds. Seven. So it's a lot of silver, yes. and people really want that trophy. Lamar Hunt was very proud when his Kansas City Chiefs won the Super Bowl back in 1970. And that trophy itself became much, much more valuable as the price of silver rose. Seven pounds of silver, sterling silver, is quite is yeah. quite a load of silver. Okay, so I guess uh, the Hunt brothers or the Hunt family generations down are still obsessed with silver. Well, they certainly aren't giving up <laughs> their Super Bowl trophy. Yes. Also in, in that area, in that era, one, one question I like to ask people around my age, uh, what was your take or, or feeling when uh, Nixon closed the gold window back in 71? What was their fear? Or I know you were a bit younger, but what were maybe your parents or grandparents? What were they saying around the dinner table? Well, I, I must say, I'm, I'm glad you thought you said that I was much younger. I was much younger, but I actually was working in Washington at the time at the Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, so I was right in the center of this particular event. And there were two things in 1971's, in Nixon's 1971 announcement that were uh, unprecedented. One was something called wage price controls. What he did was he froze wages and prices. You couldn't change prices for three months. This is the United States with a free economy, and he imposed a freeze on wages and prices. And that was at least as monumental as severing the gold window. That meant that foreign central banks 
could no longer come to the U.S. Treasury and exchange their dollars for gold. This was viewed more technically. It wasn't viewed as a big deal. I didn't think it was such a big deal until the central bank, the Federal Reserve System, without this restraint of gold, was able to respond with easy money throughout the 1970s, which in fact triggered the inflation. So the severing of the gold didn't have an immediate effect at least in the United States, but it did change the conduct of the Federal Reserve System, America's central bank. Professor Silber, you've lived through several major milestones in terms of the changes in the global monetary system, like Brent Wood's uh, agreements and its subsequent failure, the delinking of the dollar which, uh, from gold, which we just spoke about, and the rise of the petrodollar. Looking back, how have these events shaped your views about money and monetary policy? Well, uh, the, the biggest change after uh, 1971, when Nixon severed uh, the connection between the dollar and gold, was that we shifted to something called fiat currency. Fiat currency is currency backed only by the creditworthiness of the government, not tied to any precious metal. And it's the first time in world history that the world went on a fiat currency standard. In other words, it was up to the central banks to control money. And initially, they almost failed. Because in the 1970s, we had in the United States unprecedented inflation. And that's what led to uh, the, the silver boom and gold as well. Interestingly, we are still 50 years into the experiment on fiat currency because until, t- until today, we still have dollars and the euro backed only by the central bank's pledge to keep those dollars and the euros having purchasing power. It's a, it's a 50 year experiment that so far has been successful. Yeah. 50 years is like a heartbeat in world history. We're still in the experiment and it remains to be seen whether the central banks will continue to succeed. With all that you just said, do you think we're near a point in history where the current system of using the dollar as the main global reserve currency will end and we will transit to a new monetary system? I mean, history has shown that reserve currency status, they do change over time. Yes, but they change very, very slowly. So I'm going to paraphrase Winston Churchill and say, the dollar is the worst currency except for all the others. So we, we only have the US dollar as what, what I would call world money. And um, the, it's hard to find something that can replace it. People talked about the Euro. The Euro is not big enough. It's not doesn't have a unified political entity behind it. People talked about the the yuan, the Chinese yuan. Until you have freedom, uh, complete freedom of trust that the government will allow you to bring money in and take it out, that won't work either. So we're stuck with the dollar. But I would tell everyone that as insurance against a catastrophe, you should hold some precious metals just in case. Something happens and it will be, and once it happens, it will be too late. Why does it resemble an an insurance and how does it act as an insurance? That's a great question. And uh, precious metals belong in every portfolio. A small amount, less than 5% of the portfolio. And the reason it belongs there is because precious metals pay off when nothing else does. 
So during the last 50 years, we have had two major crises, the 1970s and the Great Inflation, and 2008 to 2011, the Great Recession. And in both of those time periods, when everything else wasn't going to work, when the world was coming to an end, the financial world was coming to an end between 2008 and 2011, silver quadrupled in value, gold doubled in value. When nothing worked, you would at least have some reserve. Similarly, in 1979, when we were worried about runaway inflation, silver quadrupled in value, gold doubled. So if you want to have insurance against catastrophe, you should buy precious metals. Yeah, and I would say silver is a better hedge against catastrophe than gold, curiously enough, because it is so volatile, which means when things really get out of hand, so when we had, for example, the European debt crisis in 2011, yeah. when government debts in Europe were about to, were wor worried about um, uh, uh, going bankrupt, silver went up much, much more than gold, and that's when you need something to protect yourself. So the fact that it it went up four times rather than just doubling was, an, was a big help when catastrophe threatened. Now, when the threat from the Great Recession has declined, silver has gone down twice as much, which makes it a bargain. A bargain. I think everybody likes that word. But um, we, we've seen a lot of people, they, they jumped in 2009, 2010 um, on the uptick of, of silver. And it's it has come down since uh, 2011 at, at, from its highest point, uh, recent highest point. Um, in, in your opinion, why, why do you think that price of silver, even gold, why do you think it has fallen fairly substantially since 2011? Well, 2011 was the height of the crisis. Um, Italy, people were worried about the government debts of Italy, not to mention, not to mention Greece. So surely gold and silver went up then because if you have a default by a major European government, what would you use to go out and buy bread? Not much, except a precious metal. Now that has receded that has receded, concern has receded, and therefore precious metals have come down. You don't buy insurance when your house is on fire. You buy it beforehand, and you sit and you hold it. And you hope that you don't have to use it. You hope that it just sits there. So you, right now, when there is no global threat, it's a good time to take out insurance. Professor Silber, do you think uh, currencies should always derive their value from gold and silver? Well, that comes back once again to this, what we call this experiment. So for the past 50 years, the integrity of the world's currencies have rested with central banks that have focused on maintaining low inflation. As long as central banks in the world continue to keep inflation under control, then we can live with fiat currency. It's only when central banks are pushed to inflate, either by a totalitarian regime like Venezuela or by fiscal constraints, if for some reason you keep on running a deficit and you have to create money and too much money gets created, then the central banks will fail. So far, the central banks have succeeded. If they continue, then we don't need to have the currencies of the world, the dollar, the euro, exchangeable into precious metals, 
But that doesn't mean you don't need insurance. A little bit will help. You knew uh, Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke pretty well. Were you in step with his policies or at times did you have different ideas that you that you influ or tried to influence upon him? Well, uh, look, uh, uh, Ben Bernanke did a great job after the Great Recession, after the recession of 2008. He poured out liquidity. The world needed liquidity. And Bernanke is a student of the Great Depression in the 1930s, and he was determined not to repeat that. And I think his policies succeeded. Now, of course, we have to start thinking about making our government, our Federal Reserve policy more normal, which is what Governor Powell, Chairman Powell is doing now. I think Bernanke does get great credit for steering the economy away from the potential for a repeat of the depression. Professor Silbert, do you think the world will go back again to a currency system that, that is linked to silver? I mean, after all, silver has been demonetized, but do you think it's needed to come back into the fold again? Central banks, as long as central banks do their job, yeah. which is guarding the integrity of the, of the currency without allowing inflation to take hold, then I think we can get along without linking the dollar to a, uh, to a precious metal, whether it's gold or silver or some combination. Uh, don't forget the United States had a combination of gold and silver for much of its history. So um, I don't think you have to have it, but you do have to have it in reserves. You do have to have it sitting on the bench, if it were, waiting to come in if, in fact, the central banks fail to do their job. And in your opinion, do you think interest rates, do you think the, the inflation rate, do you think they're about right? Well, inflation is certainly not a problem right now. Whether it will be a problem going forward, that's unclear. People who say that it will never be a problem are foolish. There's no such thing. There's no such guarantee. Um, having said that, uh, I'll say once again, you do not need to have a direct tie right now. I think interest rates are low today by historical standards. They should probably drift up a little bit. And the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank probably should withdraw a little bit from their uh, very expansive policies that you had between 2008 and 2013. I don't think we should have zero interest rates. We don't have zero interest rates in the United States. Um, and I think people should worry a little less about having uh, inflation too low. Inflation won't be too low in, the, in a democracy like the United States. You have to keep vigilant. And that's what the role of Currents. That's the role of precious metals in portfolios. Professor Silver, before we wrap up, can you let our listeners know more about your latest book, The Story of Silver, How the White Metal Shaped America and the Modern World? Well, sure. As I said, when we started, this is uh, was triggered by Nelson Bunker Hunt's death in 2014. It tells the story of how the richest man in the world went bankrupt buying more silver than he should, but it is much broader, much, much broader than that. Silver has been an integral part of American history and world history for 200 years. It's been woven into the pattern of history like the stars and stripes. The reason is We've had silver bugs, silver pressure throughout history. And that came most clearly in the 1930s. And I tell the story of how Franklin Delano Roosevelt subsidized 
silver in order to get votes by 14 senators for his New Deal program. And in the process, he drove silver up and forced China, which was on the silver standard, to abandon silver when it could least afford it. And it promoted Japanese militarism during World War, uh, leading up to World War II. So there were some great unintended consequences of America's silver policy that had implications worldwide. And if you want to see whether Nelson Bunker Hunt's manipulation was worry, was greater, that was a bigger problem than Franklin Delano Roosevelt's manipulation of the price of silver, read the book and you'll be able to give an intelligent answer. Yeah, I, I did manage to read the, uh, the acknowledgments, the, the, the beginning of the book, and um, it is full of information right from the get-go. Our listeners, where can they get a copy of that book? Well, at your local bookstore, of course, but on Amazon or Barnes & Noble, any of those websites, you can, in fact, get a, order a copy of, uh, of the book. So I hope you enjoy it. It's written in a conversational style with a light touch so that those of you who don't want to be involved in the deep details don't have to be. They're all hidden away in footnotes in the back. You can ignore the details and just enjoy the stories. The book is called The Story of Silver because there are stories. <laughs> there you go, Professor Silver. We want the details, though, so we're, we're going to dig into to that book. Um, but do, do you have a Twitter that our viewers can follow you on or, or a website that people can go to? No, but I appear every once in a while in, in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, on Market Watch on different programs. Yes. So you can, in fact, look for me there and you can email me. If you want, you have any questions, feel free to email and I'll be more than happy to respond. Send, my, send me an email and I'll answer. Professor Silber, is there anything else you'd, you'd like people to know or, or let our listeners know? Good luck in your investments. <laughs> okay. That's probably the, the main piece of advice that any of us could get. Uh, one more question. I, I have to ask you this. Sure. How was Alan Greenspan as a student? I understand you were his professor. <laughs> it was the first class that I had ever taught. Oh, no. I had just gotten I had just gotten my PhD. I was 23 years old. Oh. He was four, he was 40 and a very very well established uh, economic forecaster. Right. And he came back part-time to study for his PhD. And one of the one of my colleagues said there's a very famous man who's going to be in your class. Don't worry. Of course, that made me worry. Yes. And it turned out he was quite a good student. Okay. So I was 23 and he was 40 at the time. It was the first class that I ever taught. Okay, that is a story. Professor Silver, we, we thank you again for your time and um, we do hope we can do this again. It'll be a pleasure to come back. That was Professor William Silver, a professor of finance and economics at the Stern School of Business at the New York University. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the SBTV channel to be updated on new content. And do also check out the SBTV podcast on iTunes and Spotify. 